This widely used budget buck converter is an EMC nightmare. In vehicle applications like camper van conversions, its use is at best not standard compliant and at worst it can cause dangerous operating conditions in other vehicle components. In this video I'll show you how to measure the conducted emissions of the converter according to the CISPR 25 standard and how to bring these emissions below the required limits using a filter circuit. We're looking at a low-cost buck converter based on the LM2596S. It's typically used to step down the 12 volts vehicle power supply to 5 volts. For example, to power small devices or electronic modules in the vehicle. A maintenance-free lead-acid battery is used as the voltage source. For measurement, the buck converter module is connected via a supply lead to the battery and the output voltage is set to around 5 volts. On the output side, the module has been equipped with a USB-C port. A small LED floodlight with a current draw of about 400 milliamps is used as the load, well below the manufacturer's specified maximum output current of 2 amps. Before I go into detail about the test setup, here is a quick explanation of what the measurements refer to. In general, we distinguish between two types of emissions, conducted and radiated. Radiated emissions are interference signals emitted by the device via electric or magnetic fields. Conducted emissions, which we'll focus on here, are transmitted directly through the power or signal lines. To measure conducted emissions, we use a so-called LISN a line impedance stabilization network. A LISN serves two main purposes. First, it provides a standardized impedance to the device under test. Second, it allows the extraction of interference signals so they can be analyzed using a measurement receiver or in this case a spectrum analyzer. For the test setup, I use a symmetrical, largely standard compliant configuration with two LISNs. Both LISNs are mounted on a grounded copper plate. As specified in the standard, they are conductively connected to the plate and equipped with the required input capacitors. Since the copper plate available in my home office is a bit small, I can't fully maintain the required minimum distances and cable routing rules. But with the massive limit violations we're about to see, and considering the relative nature of the filtering effectiveness we'll later assess, that's not a big issue. The extracted interference signals are measured using a Sigland SSA 3021X Plus, equipped with the EMI option. This option enables the standardized 9 kHz resolution bandwidth and quasi-peak detection using a special peak detector. To simplify the process, I use the EMC view software from TechBox instead of manually configuring the CISPA 25 limits in the spectrum analyzer. The software controls the measurement automatically, sets the correct resolution bandwidths, and accounts for frequency dependent insertion losses from the lisons and measurement cables. EMC view is compatible with many common spectrum analyzers and can be used license free, but only for measurements up to 10 MHz. The lisons are also from TechBox, so the correction factors are already included in the software. The measurement range spans from 150 kHz to 108 MHz. The blue and red lines represent the maximum permissible CISPR 25 limits. The blue lines indicate the peak value limits and the red lines show the maximum allowable average values of the interference. For EMC compliance, both limits must be met. If either the peak or average limit is exceeded at any point, the device fails the test. So this buck converter has already failed. The limit violations exceed 30 decibels, putting them clearly in the critical range, even though the logarithmic display makes it look less dramatic at first glance. Just to recap, a 20 dB excess means the interference voltage is 10 times higher than allowed. At 30 dB, it's roughly 32 times over the limit. In its current state, the buck converter exceeds the allowed limits at 238 
28 measurement points. One of the most common suggestions in the comments under my short video on this topic was to use decoupling capacitors in the supply line. So I soldered four capacitors, 100 microfarads, 10 microfarads, 100 nanofarads, and 10 nanofarads in parallel on a small piece of perf board. This capacitor board is inserted between the lizens and the buck converter and the measurement is repeated. Let's see if it makes a difference. After the measurement we can say the capacitors did have some effect but unfortunately not enough. That was to be expected. Both the voltage source and the input of the buck converter already have relatively low impedance. Additional small impedances like those from the capacitors bring limited benefit in this case. To effectively suppress interference you need significant impedance jumps and that's exactly what's missing here. A slightly better idea is to insert a Pi filter into the supply line. The Pi filter shown here consists of a 47 microhenry inductor and two 150 nanofarad capacitors located on the underside of the board. This results in a cutoff frequency of around 120 kilohertz. The filter replaces the previously tested decoupling capacitors and is again placed between the lizens and the converter and the measurement is repeated. Compared to the capacitors this shows much better attenuation at lower frequencies but still not full compliance with the limits. So apparently the Pi filter isn't much help either. Some of you may have noticed that the bump just above 10 megahertz remains unchanged. That's not by accident and before someone complains in the comments no it's not near field coupling. To rule that out I did an extra measurement this this time with a conductive grounded shield between the filter and the converter. The result pretty much unchanged. To get to the root of the interference we need to understand the different propagation modes on the supply lines. Specifically we're dealing with two types of noise here. Differential mode and common mode. Differential mode noise occurs when interference signals travel in opposite directions along the positive and negative lines. Common mode noise on the other hand flows in the same direction through both lines and typically returns via radiated emissions or coupling effects. In this case capacitive coupling to the ground plane. Each type of interference behaves differently in EMC terms and requires its own filtering strategy. Since two lizens are used in the setup it's relatively easy to modify the test to separately measure differential and common mode noise. For this a TBLM1 lizen mate from TechBox is connected to the two lizens. Depending on the desired mode, either the differential or common mode output of the listen mate is connected to the spectrum analyzer. The unused output is terminated with a 50 ohm resistor. When analyzing differential and common mode emissions separately, a familiar pattern appears. Differential mode noise decreases with increasing frequency while common mode noise increases. This is partly because the coupling and radiation mechanisms typical for common mode noise become stronger at higher frequencies. Effectively suppressing common mode noise requires significantly more advanced measures. Therefore it's time to level up with the Design Your EMC Filter Kit from Wirt Electronic. This thing is basically a survival kit for conducted EMC stress. In addition to a brochure explaining proven EMC filter topologies and their function, it contains all sorts of components to quickly build and test such filters. The most important part for our buck converter problem, common mode chokes. These chokes consist of two symmetrically wound coils on a shared core. For signals that appear identically and in phase on both lines, like common mode interference, they present a high impedance. For differential signals, the magnetic fields cancel each other out and the choke becomes virtually invisible. At least in theory, but we'll get to that. Sample circuit 1 from the EMC filter kit is a classical filter structure often used to solve EMC issues. It's designed to suppress both common and differential mode interference. For common mode noise, the Y capacitors provide a direct path to ground. The high impedance of the common mode choke further attenuates these disturbances. 
From the perspective of differential mode noise, this circuit functions as a simple LC filter. Ideally, a common mode choke wouldn't have any impedance for differential mode signals. But in practice, a certain amount of leakage inductance is unavoidable. This actually unwanted effect can be beneficial in EMC terms, as it helps suppress differential mode interference. Since the test setup, unlike mains power devices, doesn't include a protective earth, the Y capacitors are instead connected to the ground line. The filter circuit is integrated into the converter's power supply lines and another measurement is taken. Let's see if the EMC issues are finally solved. And here's the disappointing result. While there's a bit of attenuation on the differential mode noise, the common mode interference, which we're actually targeting, remains almost unchanged. How can that be? At this point, we should stop blindly building circuits and hoping for the best. To present the interference signals with the greatest possible impedance jumps, it's time to fall back on the old pharmacy principle. More is better. So the circuit is beefed up with generously sized 1000 microfarad X capacitors and a larger common mode choke. If this doesn't work, I'm out of ideas. New measurement, new hope. And in fact, the noise at the lower frequencies is now significantly reduced. But the persistent peak around 10 MHz just won't go away. What the f***? The cause, believe it or not, lies with the Y capacitors and how they are connected to the ground rail. The well-intentioned idea turns out to be counterproductive. Instead of providing an effective path for common mode noise, they simply bypass the common mode choke, a common real-world mistake which I've deliberately included here. Y capacitors only work if they are connected to a grounding point that's isolated from the power lines. A conductive enclosure or the vehicle's chassis, for example, could serve as a suitable connection point. To demonstrate this, a metal housing is placed over the buck converter and connected to the Y capacitors. The result? Common mode noise is now much better suppressed. However, I won't pursue the shielding approach further here, not just because radiated emissions and shielding will be the subject of another video, but also because even this setup isn't truly effective. If you simply leave the Y capacitors unconnected, the measurement result is nearly identical. One more try before I give up. The filter circuit with the two X capacitors and one common mode choke produced the best result so far. So now I'll build a multi-stage version with a second common mode choke. I'll skip adding another X capacitor and rely on the capacitors already at the converter's input. And there it is. Ignoring the peaks in the FM broadcast band, all limits are finally met. Awesome. Here is a zoomed in image of the measurement in the FM broadcast band. The remaining peaks correspond to local FM radio stations, which couple into the setup due to lack of shielding. But the converter of course is not to blame for that. 